All right, everyone. So now we're moving to uh, the last talk of today. Um, so the second keynote speaker, which is um, Dr. Sarah Teichman, who uh, probably doesn't need any introduction to, to most of us here, uh, especially those who are in the SCA community already. But I'd like to try anyway. So um, Sarah did her PhD at the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge with uh, Dr. Sarah Shortier. And then she received um, a bit Memorial Fellow for her postdoctoral training with um, Professor Bennett Taunton at the University College London. She was um, then uh, become a group leader at the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology between the year 2001 and 2012. And I was one of her PhD students during that time. So just to set the record straight, my PhD was toward, uh, 2012 rather than 2001. So um, in 2013, she moved to the Wellcome Trust um, campus in, in Hingston, uh, Cambridge, where her group uh, was a joint um, between uh, EMBL, uh, European Bioinformatics Institute, or EBI, and the Wellcome Trust Sanker Institute. And since the year 2016, she, become, um, uh, she served as a head um, of cellular genetics at the Wellcome Trust Sanker Institute. So uh, Sarah is an uh, EMBO member, uh, a fellow of both um, the Royal Society and also Academy of uh, Medical Science. Uh, her work has been recognized by a number of prizes, including the Lister Prize, uh, Biochemical Society Coworth Medal, Royal Society Crick Lecture, and the EMBO uh, Gold Medal, just to name a few. So um, specifically regarding uh, the SCA, most of us already know that Sarah is a, one of the co-founders co-founder with uh, Dr. Avid Regev, and uh, they continue to serve as a co-chair. So uh, Sarah continues to play a leading role in the SEA's uh, effort um, to comprehensive uh, reference uh, a map of human cells uh, in different fronts. And without further ado, um, please uh, welcome our keynote speakers, Sarah Taiman. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Yod, for that amazing uh, kind introduction. It's a true pleasure to be speaking here at HCA Asia, and I will share my screen now. It's uh, great to be here at the HCA Asia meeting and um, talking to you about our adventures in cell mapping. Mapping the human body is an idea with a long history, and um, in his Nobel lecture over 20 years ago, Sidney Brenner said, the cell map project for which we don't need a model organism will be one of the few things to occupy us for the next decades. And you know, here we are at the human cell atomization meeting 20 years later. Of course, what, what Sydney didn't know was that there'd be a resolution revolution in genomics, um, which is single cell genomics. And it's really that technology together with the spatial genomics technologies that made the HCA feasible and that made it clear that the time was right to launch an international consortium to build that cell map, to build the human cell atlas. And, and so if we look back at our timeline, you know, the community has grown amazingly since we had our kickoff meeting in 2016. Um, you know, there were a hundred people at this meeting in London, um, and we now have over 2,400 members in 83 countries. We've got cross-tissue atlases, so we're in the era of HCA where we are, we're ready to start assembling the atlas, we're ready to start integrating data from individual tissues and organs, and we have uh, an integrated uh, sort of gold standard data set for the lung now, for instance. Um, and of course, we have an incredible community with HCA Asia, HCA Africa, um, the working groups, the biological networks. Um, so it's, it's, it's an incredibly exciting time and a true pleasure to be here. In, I'm, I'll talk about the research in my own group today. This was the, the steer that I got. And, um, uh, and of course, within my own group, kind of one of the, the perspectives that we're coming from is mapping the immune system. That's what kind of drove me towards single cell genomics because it's a system that has uh, so much complexity in, in, in its uh, cells, in the niches where the cells are operating. 
And it really contributes to um, not only our defense against challenges, as we've experienced with COVID, but also to tissue maintenance, tissue development, and homeostasis. And uh, where we really started our journey in human cell outsing was at the maternal fetal interface, in other words, the placenta. And uh, that that's particularly fascinating because, of course, it's the um, a, a scenario where the maternal immune system is faced with foreign antigens, and um, and 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 the big conundrum was really how does the maternal immune system tolerate those foreign antigens? And using cell atlas technologies, we're able to comprehensively map the placenta and also the, the maternal side, the decidua, and understand the the the, the cells, the donation of the tissue, and the mechanisms of, of tolerance in terms of both cell-cell signaling and, and um, enzymatic activities that contribute to the anti-inflammatory milieu and so on. Together with Moss Hanifa as a partnership and a beautiful HCA partnership, we've uh, systematically studied the development of the immune system in embryonic and fetal stages. And it's you know incredibly exciting that we're gonna have um, the development and pediatric meeting in Paris in November. And I hope many of you will join us there either online or in person. Um, and then we've also studied mucosal interfaces of just the lung and gut. Uh, over the years, as well as muscle niches in, in um, heart and skeletal muscle and, and cross tissue immunity. As I mentioned, we're in, we're living in the era of um, a, an HCA uh, where we have data across many, many tissues and we've dug deep into the immune system in this, uh, in this effort. And, and this is what I'll talk about next. Um, so, so my group has, has been interested in cell mapping at scale during development physiology and disease. And, and as I said, one of the, the exciting um, sort of uh, uh, times that, uh, that we're living through at the moment is that we have sufficient data from across the human body, <clears throat> sorry, that we can think about putting the pieces together and assembling the human cells. And this is sort of like, assembling the golden path for the human genome project, which is stitching the individual context, the individual pieces together to make whole chromosomes. And we can begin to think in that way for some tissues and organs in the human cell list, at least in suspension cell and nuclear data, if not in 2D tissue sections and three dimensions. So I'll first talk about our recent work on cross-tissue immunity and cell typist, the cell type encyclopedia and automated annotation, and then go on to unpublished work on heart cell atlas and drug targets. And this cross-tissue immunity work uh, I, I wanna highlight for the HCA community was also published in a first HCA mini bundle where a bunch of uh, sort of three or four papers came out kind of simultaneously, three in the same issue of science and one released online at the same time. And um, from an HCA community point of view, you know, this, this was, was really successful in the sense that, uh, you know, it, it was noted sort of uh, by the biomedical community and we hope to go forward with more publication bundles like that with the community and we'll be in touch about that going forwards. So the question that we were asking in this project, which was a, a fantastic collaboration with colleagues in Cambridge, Joe Jones and Cora Saif Parsi, and also um, uh, colleagues in, in New York from Columbia, uh, Donna Farber and Peter Sims, uh, what we were asking was what are the cell states of the immune system in different tissues in the body? What are the cell states across organs? And what particular features of the same cell type is context specific? And, and, and are there some modifications across different tissues? So in order to answer those questions, what we need is uh, a, a, a cell type in, encyclopedia, an integrated uh, framework of categorizing cells across tissues. And, and towards this end, we, we collected data from, from 12 deceased transplant donors and, and about a dozen different lymphoid and non-lymphoid tissues from these donors. So these are, to be clear, these are cadaveric dead donors that are then, the organs are taken for transplantation and then surgery is done to dissect out biopsies from 
lymphoid tissues like um, spleen, lymph nodes, blood, bone marrow, uh, and, and, and some thymus, and uh, non-lymphoid tissues like airways, gastrointestinal system, skeletal system, kidneys, and so on. And um, uh, what we what we did was take these, you know, three hundred thirty thousand cells from our from our data set of enriching immune cells and going deep into the immune compartment in these different tissues and integrate about 20 public data sets that had been collected previously um, and that had that, that that had existing annotation. We actually started from these public data sets. Uh, what Chuan Shu and Tomas Gomez and, and others in the group did was to curate, curate the, the labels and harmonize these data sets in terms of the different cell types within the data sets and then train uh, machine learning models in order to, to develop an automated annotation, which we could then apply to this 330,000 cell data set of immune cells, where we also had uh, um, T cell receptor, B cell receptor, VDJ sequencing. We then went through iterations of, of manual curation and updating the models to have a final annotation of this data set. And so what we're trying to get towards here in an iterative process is a set of, um, uh, a set of models so that we can do sort of data-driven cell annotation. And, and really, again, uh, sort of thinking about where we stand in terms of um, uh, so, sort of um, knowledge that comes from scholarship of cell annotation, the scholarly process, intellectual process of annotating cells versus sort of modeling the data automatically is that we're somewhere kind of here or on the left-hand side. So the more, the less data you have, the more you have to sort of input your own expertise. And this is adapted from a colleague in the computer science department in, in, uh, here at the University of Cambridge, his, his little sketch. Um, and what we hope to get is, is in, into a domain where we have a lot of data, we can make, uh, uh, we can rely on automated model, models. We don't have to put in so much of our own knowledge or expertise into the annotation. So with, with uh, what we want to develop was a cross-tissue database and server to have an interpretable pipeline for this label transfer of cells. And um, we started with, with a, a focus on immune cell types because this was our, 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 what we were working on our expertise. And uh, the, the framework that we used was logistic regression, just canonical machine learning approach, which gave us high, a good good performance, basically, good uh, uh, um, sensitivity and specificity. Also speed, basically, which we see achieved by stochastic gradient descent learning for the optimization of the models. And this is available online at celltypist.org. It's a tool for precise and rapid annotation. The initial focus was on these immune cell types and states. Chuan has now put online models for other tissues. Our main aim here in the end is to have a single model for, for all human cells so that you, you can just input and then the, the server tells you automatically um, what your cells are regardless of tissue. Of course, with the automated annotation, there's also a kind of calling card for each cell, a sort of lookup database that has uh, curated markers and a short description of the cell and there are two different levels of hierarchy, more fine-grained and more, more uh, higher level coarse-grained level as well. So using cell typists, what we're able to, um, um, to achieve is this, rel this relatively fine-grained annotation of cell states that you can see in the columns here for myeloid cells, um, so sort of um, uh, innate, professional innate immune cells, the B cell compartment, which you can see along here, and T and other lymphocytes, um, which you can see in the columns here. And then what we have is the distribution for each cell state in the different um, lymphoid and, and non-lymphoid tissues, so in the immune and non-immune tissues. And then what the, the um, enrichment shows you is whether a specific cell state is enriched in a given tissue and whether it's statistically sort of highly specific for that tissue with the asterisks. And so what we see, for instance, for bone marrow is kind of enrichment of, of progenitor cells in the B cell compartment, which is you know, kind of not surprising. It's what you expect. 
um, for the spleen, enrichment of B-cell developmental stages, as you expect. Um, for lymph nodes, basically, um, uh, again, T and B-cell states. In, in the lung, there are particular multiple different specific macrophage states that we discover. And then in the gut, really interesting tissue resonant T cell memory states. And for each of these compartments, what we're able to do is to add kind of color and resolution to, to identify different substates. So for instance, in the T cell memory compartment, um, we're able to distinguish uh, different effector memory states that are that have CRTAM, a kind of receptor, tissue resin a receptor that's holding on to the epithelium uh, versus the CX3CR1 cell state. We have different developmental states that are sort of shuttling between the spleen and, and um, the, the gut, basically the um, sort of peripheral tissue with different levels of uh, CCR9, so chemokine receptor kind of when it's in these different locations. And um, we can interpret these different states uh, in terms of the different tissue retention sort of cell surface receptors that are known to be on T cells and different um, receptors that avoid exit cues. This is from a nice review by Donna Farber showing um, the, the, the roles of different molecules on the cell surface. And we can classify the different cell types that we see in terms of these known molecules on the cell surface. So in summary, um, I've, I've sort of gone over this work very quickly because it's published, as I mentioned, as part of this bundle. What we can learn from this cross tissue at Atlas is that <laughs> we're, we're in the era of assembling the, the human cell atlas, at least in terms of these suspension cell data sets. We can integrate a system across the body and develop automated reference and annotation frameworks. And I want to again acknowledge the people that I've mentioned. This was a team of teams that made this possible, including the transplant surgeon, of course, Saad Parsi and his team at the Cambridge Biopository for Translational Medicine. Joe Jones in the clinical school, who's a immunology uh, collaborator, and also Mena Clapworthy in the clinical school in Sanger. Um, our collaborators in New York, uh, Peter Sims and Donna Farber, and also Mira Youssef's group from the CCI Immune Aging Network. And uh, Cecilia Dominguez Conde, who was an incredibly talented postdoc in, in my group and has now gone on to start her own group at the Human Technopole in Milan, and Chuan Shu, who uh, continues to develop cell typists in the group. And of course, we mustn't forget to thank the donors and their families. Next, I'm going to tell you about uh, another facet of um, the Human Cell Atlas project that I, that I feel we are, we are sort of really entering at full force now and running at full speed, which is going into the, the 3D context of tissues in a, in a high throughput automated way. I mean, already I mentioned to you in the, the placenta and the decidua, you know, we're able to place cells in their tissue context using computational methods um, uh, coupled with conventional single molecule fission and histochemistry and so on. Um, but of course, the spatial methods are, are kind of hitting prime time, if you like, where we can uh, really go into a full 2D and 3D context of niches in a, in a systematic way. And um, we need to um, really understand systematically how cells fit into their tissue environment here um, and take that suspension cell view into the um, histology and morphology. And for the heart, which is what I'm going to show you as an exemplar here, <clears throat> in, the, in the past, we had a wonderful collaboration with, with um, colleagues in Germany and the US to, um, to study the, the different cell compartments of the, um, the, the muscle walls of the four chambers of the heart, so the, the two atria and the two ventricles, apex and septum. And, and um, what, what we're able to, to unravel there using a combination of cell and nuclear transcriptomics are, are the major compartments and also fine grained cell types in the cardiomyocyte compartment, also in the immune compartment, stromal cells and the, the vascular cells with some, some adipocytes and, and, um, and neural cells. Now, that of course, the heart is is a much more complex than just this muscular um, components in in the free walls. 
it, there's the cardiac conduction system, there are the valves, the, the vessels and so on. And so overall, you can see that we really need to get towards a much more comprehensive mapping of the different tissues and understand how they work together to make the organ function. It's not as complex as the brain that has hundreds of different tissue locations and regions, but it the heart has about you know, 20 to 30 or so, depending on how you classify. And really understanding all of these tissues and how they operate together is key to understanding um, the cardiovascular disease, if you like, which is obviously a massive problem. <laughs> and the way we went about discovering spatial microenvironments of the heart is um, using a, a combination of um, uh, Visium 10x genomic spatial transcriptomics. And of course, these are 50 micron resolution voxels um, that we're, we're mapping transcriptomically in, in X and Y over about a half centimeter squared sort of field of view. And as well as uh, considering the, the, the tissue histology from the H and E staining and, and simple bright field microscopy and working with the manual structural annotation of the tissue um, with expert uh, pathologists and specifically a big shout out to a uh, Yen Ho at Imperial. And so what we did was combine the manual annotation with unbiased analysis where we're uh, defining microenvironments here using non-negative matrix factorization for discovering repeated co-localization of cell types. And um, what, we, what we did was to, to, um, to then really combine the automated with the manual and identify which, which and harmonize those different, those different approaches. And I'll explain that in a bit more detail in a minute. What we also did in this work was to expand our cell phone database that we developed early on from the immunology perspective to, to generalize it more and include G protein coupled receptors systematically. So cell phone had about, um, I think 1200 interactions or 1800 interactions. And we added that, that many interactions again. So for any users out there, you'll be happy to hear that this is, this is being considerably expanded now to include all those uh, GPCR interactions, which are also prime drug targets, of course. So in terms of manual annotation of the sinoatrial node, which is in the, um, the, 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 um, really the, the, um, the, the right atrium and the, the region where cells spontaneously fire to then determine the rate at which the heart beats. Um, you can see these different regions that Yen manually annotated. And what we can do is, of course, look for statistical enrichment of cells in these different regions. Um, but in addition to that manual and statistical cell enrichment track, in parallel, what we can also do is analyze purely the spatial transcriptomics alone and basically um, use cell to location, which is a probabilistic inference framework developed by a talented student, Vitaly Kvachevnikov, with Omar Bayraktar and Oli Stegler's groups, and then define uh, the, the the integration of the single cell transcriptomics with single um, with spatial transcriptomics and sing, uh, de spatial transcriptomics decomposed by reference data from single cell and single nuclear transcriptomics, and then look for repeated uh, cell states that are co-occurring. And if we do that in in that unbiased way, we can see that the nodal region that contains the pacemaker center, or the pacemaker cells in the heart. Um, defined manually by Yen, is now decomposed into two regions, the peripheral node and the centric node. And those two regions defined by cell-to-location NMF model um, contain in, in the center the pacemaker cells along with fibroblasts and neural cells, and in the periphery adipocytes, fibroblasts, and macrophages that are kind of insulating the uh, electrically firing pacemaker cell, if you like. So the, the, the automated approach kind of fine can, can, can subdivide the, um, the histological annotation. And what this, taking these tracks together, these different approaches to dissect the, this, the, the microenvironments and niches, we're able to identify an immune niche, as I told you, we're particularly interested in understanding the contribution of the immune system to tissue homeostasis. And we find this in the epicardium, in other words, in the, in the outside lining of the heart, where we think that this interaction between macrophages, fibroblasts, and B cells, both IgG and IgA, 
are contributing to defense of the heart against the dirty lung that's sort of next door. So we have this immune niche around the edge of the heart with macrophages, fibroblasts, and, and platinum B cells kind of defending us against the outside and keeping our heart sort of clean and healthy. Um, what we're also able to define using um, this sort of fine-grained tissue histology are mini kind of fibrotic areas that contain macrophages, um, endothelial cells, parasites, signaling with, with fibroblasts in this kind of circuitry. Um, and uh, this, this sort of uh, mini fibrosis is basically occurring in these donor hearts in, in the absence of pathology. So it's just happening basically in, as we age that we accumulate these sort of um, microfibrotic regions. And, and what we think is occurring mechanistically is that they're, they're, the fibroblasts are being activated through the, the myeloid cells and the, the, the vascular cells to then lay down um, uh, and secrete collagens into the, the microenvironment. So I've mentioned uh, the sinoatrial node to you that's, that's identified schematically here in this eating little region in the right atrium. It's, by the way, the surgeons can't see this. This is something that's only visible under the microscope as this, this region that I showed you um, identified by Yen. And then the, the, there are very, very few cells that are actually doing the firing. They haven't been identified previously in human, uh, sort of at, the, at this molecular detail. And, and it's that, that center that then um, sends the signal through the cardiac conduction system, Kinji fibers and these, these that you can see schematically here to the, 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 the muscles in the, in the four chambers and to kind of coordinate the beating. And it's basically the, the pacemaker cells sitting within that sinoatrial node um, that are determining how fast our heart beats. They're amongst the only spontaneously firing cells in the human body. And the way we identified them was uh, by looking for specific channels, calcium channels that are uh, also from, from urine studies known to be specific to uh, pacemaker cells and that distinguish this little region of about 50 cells that we're identifying here from two donor hearts. We now have more hearts in the meantime. Uh, and, and distinguishing them from working cardiomyocytes that have a typical sort of sodium channel expression that you can see over here. And if we dig into the, um, the specific expression of um, GPCRs and other receptors, which are shown in the columns here, we can see that those pacemaker cells that are in the red box have a very distinct pattern compared to atrial cardiomyocytes shown here, ventricular, ventricular cardiomyocytes, and neurons. So they have a a very characteristic pattern of, of receptors that distinguishes them from, from the other cell types and makes us confident that these are indeed pacemaker cells. Now, as you can imagine, these cells that are controlling our heart rate are the, the, um, the target for many drugs to control to lower heart rate or increase heart rate and so on. And um, we wanted to make that connection mechanistically to the, to the um, cardiovascular drugs using the Kemble database. Kemble is a, a database um, maintained by our neighbors at the European Bioinformatics Institute. It contains uh, 2 million compounds. So these are small molecule drugs and tool compounds and antibodies, and then basically assays and, and targets of those drugs. So it links the molecules to their endogenous targets in the human body. And um, what we developed was a statistical framework called drug to cell to uh, take Kemble and then link it specifically to the drug targets in the single cell transcriptomics data and look for enrichment of targets in specific cell types. Now, if we focus again on the pacemaker cells as a specific exemplar of this, then um, what we expect is to have drugs that are um, cardiovascular drugs controlling heart rate, vapidine, quinidine, atropine, that are clinically used as chronotropics, in other words, controlling heart rate, we expect them to be targeting the pacemaker cells. And that's what you can see in pink here. What we didn't expect was that there are diabetes drugs that are targeting pacemaker molecules in the pacemaker cells. And that, that was a real surprise, a surprise. And the reason for that, which we, of course, um, dug into is that the GLP-1 receptor, 
glucagon, which is uh, controls our uh, glucose metabolism, as a, a hormone in, in, of the endocrine system that's controlling sort of food and glucose and so on, uh, th there's a receptor for, for the, the GLP-1 receptor that's actually expressed in pacemaker cells. And so that means that these drugs, uh, um, which are, by the way, known to have a, um, a side effect or an effect on heart rate, um, uh, th that's the mechanism through which they could be operating. And that wasn't previously known because although it was observed and, and to some extent acknowledged, although although quite controversially, of course, because um, you know there's a controversy around these side effects. It was that that um, it was unclear whether that impact on heart rate was operating through the the nervous system, the auto autonomic nervous system, that's signaling to the pacemaker cells, brainstem, uh, board, and so on, signaling through the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system to the pacemaker cells, or whether there's a direct mechanism of action on the pacemaker cells. And what this drug to cell framework can do is to kind of point us towards hypotheses for how these mechanisms may be acting. So I'd like to summarize for this part of the talk that we can um, discover tissue microenvironments through um, uh, linking cell type composition and histological uh, regions to unbiased discovery of, of microenvironments and also um, uh, the power of HCA as a lookup system for drug targets. Um, and then for this part of the, the talk, I'd like to acknowledge um, the amazing team of, of Dr. Kazimaza Kanemaru, who's a talented Takeda postdoctoral fellow in the group, a clinician scientist from Japan, uh, James Cranley, who's a welcome clinical cardiological PhD student in the group, other members of the group, and then fantastic collaboration with the Noseda lab at Imperial, um, which was a close, close interaction. Um, uh, the funders uh, and the donors and their families again, of course. For the next five years of HCA, uh, we want more of the same. I think it's it's been an amazing journey and it's, it's a really exciting time ahead. And I think the, the era that, that we're now in is that we can increase the global reach and, you know, HCA Asia, the, the community here and also Africa has been, uh, you know, fantastic in, in that way. And of course, HCA, HCA Asia was there kind of from early on and now the, the, the reach is growing globally. Um, as I mentioned, we, we are in the era where we can really think about HCA in three dimensions and across time scales of development, disease, aging and so on. Um, and and, um, and and what I hope I've also shown is the implications of HCA for mechanistic understanding and for clinical impact. And that I expect that to increase uh, uh, and, and, and in depth and breadth over the next five years. Thank you, and I'll take any questions. Good morning, Sarah. Can you hear us okay? Hi. Hi, Sarah. Hi. So I'm sure that there'll be um, quite a few questions, but um, maybe can, if I can start with the first one, if that's okay. So it's, sure. it's kind of a little bit of um, in the context of SEA itself and also um, may, maybe related to, um, you know, like tools or like, you know, um, you know, different algorithms that we use to do the cell type annotations. So can, can I ask, like, you know, in the context of like, um, since, you know, different groups, right, try to develop, you know, different platform for cell type annotations. So in a way, I can see that um, it's, it's probably good to have, you know, some diversity that, you know, different people do different things. And, and then, uh, yeah, in the end, um, you can try different things. Um, of course, there's no such uh, two things that uh, do exactly the same thing. But then I think in, in terms of like, you know, um, the user point of view, wouldn't, wouldn't it be like a good idea to have like a gold standard, you know, like one? Absolutely. I know, yeah. So, so I wonder, yeah. you know, if, if these two kind of like, you know, go against the other and, and in the context of um, SEA, which, which way we should go ahead, if that makes sense at all. So I think, you know, yeah. obviously what we need in the long term is a, a, a uniform consensus annotation for all cell types in the human body. And um, I mean, there are a couple of tools that can help us get towards that annotation, consensus annotation from a, from a, 
a kind of uh, database and computational point of view. And then there's also, let's say, consortium efforts, you know, that we need to do to work together to get towards that. So from the, the computational and database point of view, you know, we have the, the EBI cell ontology framework um, that can help us uh, with, with um, you know, uniform words, let's say, that describe both cells, but also tissues, organs, and, and our anatomy. So it's a, an ontological framework. And, and you can submit, you know, your, your ontologies there and also annotate within the framework of the ontology. Then I'd also like to give a shout out to our uh, colleagues in, in the NIH HubMap Consortium uh, who are working on the ASCT plus B framework. And that, that can also be, so ASCT plus B is anatomy, you know, cell structures and cell types or something like that. Um, and that's also a, a framework kind of working with EBI cell ontology and Uberon ontology and so on to provide, again, um, more population of the, the terms and the vocabulary, basically, for the human body. I'd also like to mention um, the uh, CAP, the cell, the cell Annotation Platform that Chloe Villani is coordinating now, which is a, a computational tool um, that should help the community kind of uh, enter many different annotations and then sort of harmonize it within one platform, basically. As, a, as, a, as an aid to the scientific community for, for achieving a consensus annotation. I mean, from a community point of view, uh, you know, I, I think I, I really hope that the HSA biological networks and, um, you know, the roadmaps that they're developing towards gold standard integrations of data sets for the individual tissues, organ systems, and so on, hmm. um, that that will uh, be a a catalytic basically framework for the for for us all to work together towards a consensus annotation for each mm -hmm. you know, all the all the cells really all the different compartments whether they are you know, immune strong or epithelial um, yep. vascular or yep. neuro, neural etc kind of going forwards over over the next five years so that's definitely something that that, that we also need to work towards I didn't say it uh, you know in the in the last part of the talk. But um, you know, this is this is part of our roadmap. Yeah, thank you. So uh, we got and, and part of also the sorry, white yeah. paper yeah. two point zero, I think. Yeah. yeah, sorry. No, no, sorry. There's a bit of delay. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. No, no. Well, I mean, we, we got a few questions from uh, the floor. Yeah. So could you uh, maybe quickly introduce yourself because um, maybe she cannot see you. Yeah. Before uh, you go. Sorry. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Yeah. I'm Wu Chang Li from Seoul National University, and uh, I have a simple question from. On your last part, and the pacemaker cell, uh, yeah. I guess you used human autopsy data, right? So I, I don't so, know. No. So no. So we work closely. I tried to kind of explain it. Maybe it wasn't clear. So we work closely with the Cambridge Bar Repository for Translational Medicine. Those are our colleagues in the um, transplant surgery mm -hmm. in the hospital here in Cambridge. And so this is not autopsy. This is basically deceased transplant donors. So the process is is that um, you know mostly these these donors are on life support. Life support is withdrawn. There's a single incision, basically. You know, there's cardiac death or brain death, basically occurs. There's then a single incision from the neck to the waist in the cadaver in the deceased body. The organs are taken for transplantation, and then biopsies are taken for research. The body is perfused with transplant solutions. The blood is washed out. The body is perfused with the buffer, you know, with glucose, delivering glucose and oxygen to the body, so the blood is washed out. And then the, there's about a 15 to 20 minute window in the operating theater where uh, the, the team can work very quickly to, to get the research biopsies. So this is different from an autopsy. Hmm. It's really biochemically fresh tissue. Yeah, does, so that, does that help? You mean, yeah. you mean it is beating heart, right? No, no, they're, yeah. they're in... Um, because, because I, I have... Cardioplegic, uh, cardioplegic solution. So they're, it's immobilized. It's in cardioplegic mm -hmm. solution. Because, because yeah. it is pacemaker. So my question is, do you think it, there are some difference between, between beating heart and uh, stopped? So, and... 
And, and I mean, it's in so the. I guess it's it's. You know, there there may possibly. Um, you know, as I've explained, basically the. Um, you know, there, there may be some differences, it's, but it's the tissue is taken very, very quickly mm -hmm. and then it's put into this solution that, emo, you know, that, that um, maintains the, the tissue biochemically fresh, but the, 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 the tissue is immobilized with, with uh, this cardioplegic mm -hmm. uh, agent that stops the beating. And that may have a transcriptomic impact. I would say the cryopreservation is very fast for the mm -hmm. spatial transcriptomics. Um, and, you know, the, I mean, I also want to make you aware that this is what's done in large cardiac and vascular surgeries. Mm -hmm. So in, uh, I don't know if you're aware, but if there's a large cardiac surgery, your heart will get immobilized also with cardioplegic solution. You'll be put on an extracorporeal machine, you know, that maintains your, your vascular, the, the, the blood flow for you and deliver, you know, reoxygenizes and then the heart is reactivated at the end of the surgery so from a functional point of view we know that this you know it doesn't take away the function from the tissue okay, okay. this procedure if that makes this this preservation if that makes sense yeah yeah thank you so okay thanks um i guess we got two more questions but um yeah probably have to be quite quite short and straight please yeah sure uh my name is Hyun Jae Kim from Seoul Nation University, the best friend of Jong Un Park. Uh, you beautifully <laughs> demonstrated that the tissue specific immune cells and the human. So, do you think that would be the adaptation of the immune cells, the result of the adaptation of the immune cells, or the developmental program? So, it's a good question. Um, I mean, I um, I think in the adult, because I like the. So I think there's contributions from both. Yeah, yeah, from I think both so. Yeah. The cell intrinsic development and also the the tissue niche. I would say you know in 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 the adult study the cells are. You know we can see trajectories of tissue adaptation and when the cell, for, yeah. it depends on the cell. Okay, exactly. so for our macrophage, basically it will just stay there, and 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 kind of you know. Even in development, some of the macrophages, you know, are yolk sac derived, and, and they will stay there forever. And so it's a kind of developmental program, yeah, or it yeah. is a developmental yeah, program. I, I totally, Whereas I, for, I, let's say, the T cells, you know, they're going back and forth. Exactly. Yeah. And then it's really, there's a lot of contribution from the tissue environment to the, to the receptor program and so on. Yeah. I think the Just, may, yeah. may cell in the liver, I think that that is the result of the... The adaptation of the T cells in the yeah, yeah okay yeah yeah exactly that's another example yeah great question right, thank you got time for one more question um, hello Dr Teichman uh, I'm Ape from IIT Delhi and uh, I did my masters with Dr Nuset at Imperial so I wanted to ask you um, so you had shown the um, um, diabetes drugs are having some effect on um, the heart cells as well, and can you yeah. can you maybe elaborate? Like, are those um, adverse effects, or what is there? Well, they're unintended. So I mean, you know, the the um, you know documented are, for instance, six beat per minute impact on heart rate. So that's not something that's intended. Um, whether it has a long term adverse effect or not is. I think unclear. We've discussed this amongst ourselves, so it's a fair, very fair and good question. Um, you know, I think in some cases it can have a be fine or not have any side effect or be a even beneficial. In other cases, you know, these kinds of phenomena can be um, detrimental. Um, and and I guess what we're trying to highlight is. Um, you know the, the the this in this particular case, understanding that there's an impact through the receptor right on the pacemaker cell, also supports the fact that that side effect is happening. 
okay? Because it's also worth being aware that that was controversial. Like, is it real? Is it not real? But what this supports is that, you know, this, this can very well be a real, a real thing. And there's a, a direct mechanism of action for this phenomenon. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So thanks a lot, Sarah. I mean, let's thank Sarah once again. I mean, for um... not at all. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. Yeah.